Morning everyone, welcome to Research at Home. Um, today we'll be listening to Kat Scott. Uh, Kat Scott is a teeny bit worried today because she has a new presentation and she really uh, shouldn't be. Uh, it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, in case you don't know, Kat is Director of Education Research at the Chartered College um, of Teaching. Um, and it has been so for what, two, three, three, four years? It's just, it's, time flies. Um, so she has an ex extensive knowledge of uh, evidence around professional learning uh, and today uh, she's going to be exploring things around collaboration uh, and uh, effective professional learning. So I'm very, very excited, very, very interested. Uh, and so without further ado, Kat, if you want to introduce yourself. Great, thank you very much. Um, yes, three years now at the Chartered College of Teaching, as you say, time does fly. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. Um, I am going to be, as, uh, as Helena said, trying a, a new presentation. I felt like it was, a, it was time to move away from talking about school professional culture, which is what I normally talk about um, recently. Um, and what I'm going to do is to, to go a bit deeper into one of the aspects of school professional culture that, that seems important, which is this notion of collaboration. I'm quite interested in the idea of collaboration. I, I think my bio probably actually says something about uh, an interest in teacher collaborative professional development. Um, but a lot of the reading that I've been doing recently has challenged some of my ideas around that. And that's what I'm going to be looking at today. Um, I've tried to shuffle my slides around a bit just now so that they're not appearing where the, uh, the video box are. So uh, if the layouts look a bit strange, um, that's why to try and make it work best on Zoom. I'll be trying to keep an eye on the Q&A panel as we're going along. So if anyone has an urgent question um, during the session, happy to respond to those. And obviously we'll take questions at the end as well. Uh, there's quite a few references in here, as you might expect um, for a research ed presentation. Um, there's a link at the end that will take you to uh, a page on the Charter College site that has um, lots of resources. Uh, there's a couple more that I've added recently to this presentation that I'll pop in straight after. And I know Helene has also included some of the um, the resources in the spreadsheet for Research at Home as well. So the question I want to look at is really delving deeper into this idea of collaboration and what it really is. Um, it felt important to start with why, uh, why uh, well, to, to, to start with some caveats because, you know, um, working in research, we always need to start with those. The first one of those is that I am going to be talking both around collaboration in general and around collaborative professional learning um, specifically. There is quite a lot of crossover in my view between those and increasingly so as we start to understand professional learning in a slightly different way, um, recognising the value of more informal professional learning. I'm also going to be touching on um, research from a range of different uh, methodologies, so there'll be some qualitative research to give a bit more depth to some of the aspects, there'll be plenty of, plenty of quantitative research, but a lot of the work that's been done around collaboration is by necessity not RCTs, it's, it's large scale um, quantitative research, but they're not testing collaboration based um, interventions. So there is always a risk, despite the best efforts the researchers have made to try and reduce any, or remove anything that might be, um, might be creating the link between things, that we are looking at correlation, not causation. And that's something to be, to be clear about. It's also worth noting that um, I am taking a reasonably narrow but quite standard notion of effectiveness. When I talk about teacher effectiveness, we're looking at how that's measured in terms of impact on pupil attainment. Of course, we know that schools have a hugely wide range of other roles that they're trying to achieve. Um, but that is going to be the sort of focus of what I'm talking about when I talk about effectiveness today. Of course, I'm not going to cover all of the literature. Um, and of course, as with anything in research, context and implementation matter. Nothing that I'm going to talk about today uh, will kind of give you all of the answers for what to do or provide any sort of a recipe or silver bullet. So why do we think teacher collaboration might be important? Why have I started with this as, as something that I want to look at? Um, I guess there's a range of reasons. Uh, I genuinely start most presentations with this because whilst I know that we're all aware of it as teachers, I think it always bears repeating that there is a huge body of research that shows us how important teachers are to the academic outcomes of pupils. It is the factor in school that actually we can make the most difference to that will affect uh, student achievement. And in particular, um, it's also a particularly, ooh, sorry, just click through a few too many slides there, we'll hop back a bit. You're getting a preview there of some of the later ones. It's also particularly true for um, 
for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. There's a huge concern about that at the moment, obviously, uh, with the concern about the achievement gap, uh, what's happening with schools being, uh, being closed physically to uh, large numbers of pupils. Um, but we know that high quality teaching is the thing that makes a really big difference for pupils from those backgrounds. So it's hugely, hugely important that we're ensuring that we have high quality teaching for our pupils as best as we can. Um, so how does collaboration link into that? A lot of the research uh, literature that you look at around teacher effectiveness, around teacher CPD, seems to make reference to collaboration. And that's what I'm going to be talking through first of all, that it seems to have a relationship to how, uh, how we can create an environment where teachers are supported to develop, to become effective. It seems to have a relationship to retention and job satisfaction. It seems to have a relationship to high quality professional learning. And also this notion of collective teacher efficacy, of, of feeling like as a community, we can make a difference for our pupils. Um, of course, all of those things are also interrelated. Um, we, we know, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, that, that teachers do generally improve over time. So retention is important if we want to increase teacher effectiveness, if teachers are all leaving within the first couple of years of their career, as, as we're seeing as an increasing issue, they're not getting to the point when they're, they're highly effective. Um, that influences their, their perception of their own effectiveness, their self-efficacy, which in turn may influence their job satisfaction and their likelihood of staying. So we end up with this quite sort of either vicious or positive cycle, depending on whether we're creating job satisfaction, um, effectiveness and self-efficacy or not. Uh, and of course, you can think about this at the level of the individual teacher, um, their own job satisfaction, their intention to stay in the profession, their effectiveness and self-efficacy. But those sit within their department, within their year group, within their school, within the wider system. This sense of kind of collective effectiveness and self-efficacy is really important as well. So the first point is, how does collaboration seem to link into a strong professional environment? Well, this is a graph that probably you'll all be familiar with. I know uh, lots of us who've spoken at research, event, uh, research ed events in the past use this, and it, it's based on um, research by Kraft and Pape. They were interested in uh, this question of, of sort of returns to teaching experience. How much better do teachers get over time? And whether a school environment makes difference to that. And you can see on the graph here, this is looking at the, the impact of teachers on maths achievement um, across their years of experience. As you'd expect in the first couple of years, teachers' effectiveness improves quite dramatically. Uh, that's no surprise when you're first learning your craft, when you're first in the classroom, you're getting better very rapidly. But then it sort of starts to change after that. And we see that sometimes some teachers in some schools continue to get better over time and some seem to plateau a lot more. Uh, and what Kraft and Pape were looking at was what made the difference between these. And, and they found, they were looking at this notion of a strong professional environment because it wasn't about individual teachers. It was about the schools that teachers were in. And it seemed that teachers in some schools that they characterized as having a strong professional environment continued to increase uh, much more so than those in schools with a weaker professional environment. Um, again, to highlight this is correlation, not causation, but uh, they did seek to try and understand other things that might be influencing why teachers continue to improve um, in, in some schools and not others. When they looked at what characterised a strong professional environment, these are the things that they found. I'll give you a moment just to have a look at these. I don't think any of those will be a huge surprise to anyone um, that actually these are the things we would all want in our schools. These are the sorts of things we can imagine really support our teachers to develop. Um, but it's interesting in there um, is, of course, this idea of opportunities for peer collaboration. So that's one of the reasons that I think collaboration is an interesting and worthwhile area to explore. Uh, also, I mentioned that teacher job satisfaction is something that, that we're seeking to address. Um, reflecting back on that last graph again we can see if teachers are getting better over time that keeping them satisfied keeping them in the profession is really important if we want to have the most effective teaching workforce possible we know that uh, that teachers do quite often leave the profession for lower paid jobs um, i don't think that's a, a question of pay not mattering to teachers at all i think it's a bit of a trade-off because they tend to have greater job satisfaction in their new jobs. So they tend to be leaving perhaps because they want this greater job satisfaction. Job satisfaction and retention are hugely tightly interrelated. Often the questions used to understand job satisfaction include questions like, are you intending to stay in, uh, in your current job or in your current career? Um, so, so naturally there's a lot of crossover there. Um, Sam Sims had a look at uh, 
at TALIS data from quite a few years ago now to try and understand what were the elements um, that seem to affect teachers' job satisfaction and consequently perhaps affecting their retention in school and in the profession. Uh, and there's a number of things here, strong leadership, cooperation, progression, professional development, discipline, feedback, manageable workload, huge crossover with the list from Craft and Pathé, which is quite comforting and also unsurprising. But we see cooperation in there as being important, chances to cooperate with other teachers. Also, historically, but we'll touch on some of the challenges to this, um, high quality professional learning, we know that high quality professional learning can um, have an impact on student achievement, student attainment, but it certainly doesn't always. There are lots of examples of CPD that don't seem to have an impact on pupil learning. Um, the teachers standards, the CPD standards, sorry, that DfE published a few years ago based on uh, work from Teach Development Trust, um, Philip Accordingly and others, uh, came up with a number of features of CPD that seem to make them more likely to be effective. You can see those here. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, but you'll notice that in particular, number three highlights that professional development should include collaboration and expert challenge. So here we go. We've got collaboration coming in again. I mentioned this notion of collective teacher efficacy. Um, this is something that John Hattie has uh, picked up on in his list of factors that influence um, student achievement. It's a sort of one that he added a few years ago, right at the top. Um, this is not without debate. Uh, John Hattie's work generally, of course, is not, not without some challenge, um, but this notion of collective teacher efficacy is also uh, subject to some debate. But I thought it's worth picking up on here. Um, it can be defined as the perceptions of teachers in a school that the efforts of the faculty, of the staff as a whole, will have a positive effect on students. So this kind of collective self-belief that what they're doing is going to make a difference for the students that they work with. Um, the way that they, they gauge this is by this kind of survey of the kind you can see here. Again, I'll include links to these, but um, they ask teachers whether they agree with statements like teachers in this school have what it takes to get the children to learn. They have some which teachers are expected to respond to negatively as well. So if, it, if they're a, if they're sort of have high efficacy. So uh, if a child doesn't want to learn, teachers here give up. So um, a range of different sort of survey items that teachers are asked to respond to, um, which you can have at sort of analyze on an individual basis to look at teacher efficacy, but you can also aggregate those to understand collective teacher efficacy. So understand whether in a school there is a sense that um, that teachers can make a difference. Um, this obviously isn't directly about collaboration, but it seems likely that when you're talking about teachers across the whole school, um, this notion of how you work with those teachers, how you understand the colleagues you work with, it seems quite linked into collaboration. So also seems to be quite important here. Um, as I said, this, this uh, meta-analyses and, uh, and work by John Hattie suggests that collective teacher ef efficacy is hugely important. Um, of course, this is a classic one where correlation and causation um, are, are really important to reflect on because it may be that actually the schools that are really good at supporting their pupils know that they're really good at supporting their pupils. Um, and it's possible that it's kind of a two-way relationship as well, that sort of confidence in what they're doing enables teachers to make the right decisions, which in turn uh, affects the outcomes of, of students, which in turn affects the confidence of teachers. So it probably, or possibly at least, is working in both directions there, and that's not always clear. Um, then if we look at, uh, sorry, it's going to be a bit odd tapping my slide there, there we go. Um, one of the things that they found was that when, uh, when this particular study from Goddard, Hoy and Wolfock, um, Hoy, they looked at using this approach to examine elementary schools in one large district, um, and they found that this collective teacher efficacy was positively associated with difference differences between schools for both reading and maths. Um, it's quite standard to use reading and maths as the way in which we're uh, identifying effectiveness here. Uh, and as I said, there's also been meta-analyses that have found similar. Um, there's also been work that's looked specifically at the impact of teacher collaboration on pupil attainment. So rather than the things we've looked at so far, which have been related to or included teacher collaboration, there have been studies specifically looking at te teacher collaboration. Um, the most interesting one of these I found, which I've um, only discovered earlier this week and would thoroughly recommend, um, from Rumfeld et al, looked at um, collaboration quality, what they refer to as collaboration quality, and the impact that had on achievement gains in math and reading. They had a 
hugely detailed piece of research that analysed all sorts of different relationships. I'm not going to talk about that in huge detail today, but um, their, their idea of collaboration quality included both the amount of collaboration that teachers engaged in and how helpful teachers said that collaboration was. Um, they looked at this across a whole range of different areas, which I will talk about a little bit later, but um, they certainly found, uh, found that there were better achievement gains in math and reading in schools that where teachers reported better quality collaboration. This was all based on self-report and the researchers um, note that that of course uh, has its challenges, um, but it was quite a large scale piece of research and really, really interesting. So there does seem to be evidence that collaboration quality in schools helps to uh, support pupil attainment. So great, maybe I can just stop my presentation now. Um, collaboration, lots of evidence to suggest that collaboration is part of professional culture, part of effective CPD, um, part of how we can help pupils to attain. So let's go off and do collaboration. Except, of course, it's not quite as simple as that. I think there's quite a few problems with, uh, with this sort of notion of collaboration and how we do collaboration, as well as some of our kind of understanding of collaboration. And that's really what I wanted to, to sort of spend the, the meat of my time on today. Um, the first of those is the definition of collaboration. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about teacher collaboration? Um, some of you will have noticed that in the Craft and Pape study, they talk about collaboration in the, the TALIS um, analysis by Sam Sims, they talk about cooperation. Um, easy to conflate those, I definitely have uh, conflated those and do conflate those, but there are differences, of course, between what we're talking about when we talk about collaboration. Is it um, co-planning and co-teaching actually really actively working together on things? Is it teachers having chances to talk in the staff room? I know some people have, have identified challenges with uh, the reduction in tendency to have central staff rooms um, affecting how much teachers talk to each other. Is it talking to other teachers on social media? Do coaching and mentoring sort of one-to-one uh, -one sort of approaches, do they count as collaboration? Is it communities of practice, uh, sort of larger groups of teachers working together, uh, research learning communities, things like that? Is it teachers engaging in lesson study where you might have three teachers working on practice in a particular area? If teachers are just doing the same thing at the same time, if you're having CPD where all of your teachers are engaged in perhaps personally chosen CPD, but at the same time, does that count as collaboration? There are 101 other things that might or might not, uh, depending on your view, be considered as collaboration. And, and that creates some complexity when we start to say collaboration is effective, because what do we really mean by that? Um, I was a, an English teacher, so uh, obviously I thought a great starting point here is to, to look at some definitions of collaboration. Um, there's uh, the sort of top three that I found when I Googled this here, um, which I think are quite interesting. This notion of, of working together in the first one to create or achieve the same thing, quite important, this idea that actually you've got to have a collective goal there. Um, the second one, the action of working with someone to produce or create something, has a real sense of needing to have something tangible at the end of it. Whereas the third perhaps is, more, is, is the sort of closest to what we think of when we talk about collaboration in teaching, the idea of working jointly with others or together, especially in an intellectual endeavor. Um, so, so less of a focus on it having to be something tangibly created at the end, but more in a sense of sort of development coming in there as a possibility. Uh, just in case you were, you were wondering, it originates from the Latin collaborare, to work together, as in laborare, labor, and everything else. Um, this idea that I had that the collaboration is sort of very broadly defined by different people is certainly um, recognized also in the literature. Um, Van Grieck and et al um, carried out a sort of uh, a review of lots and lots of different studies around collaboration and they found that it was perceived as a continuum ranging from aggregates of individuals to strong team collaboration. The idea being that actually sometimes just lots of people doing separate things were aggregated to, to mean collaboration, whereas sometimes it really genuinely meant what we might understand as team collaboration as kind of group work. Um, Rumfelter Al, who, whose study I mentioned already, um, certainly found when they looked at the literature that all collaborations are not equal, they're not equally productive. So we can't just talk about collaboration being effective and go off and do collaboration. We need to think about what is effective collaboration, what makes collaboration productive and useful. There's also um, been a very recent challenge in a paper by Sam Sims and Harry Fletcher Wood that I would certainly recommend reading. Um, their paper is challenging the sort of consensus view around what makes effective professional development. I've mentioned the, the teacher standards, uh, sorry, the CPD standards already. Um, 
these ideas that that we need to have expert challenge we need collaboration um there are other other aspects around those um and Sims and Fletcher Wood have, have suggested that actually some of the evidence that is used to underpin those ideas, um, some of the research that's been used, doesn't really enable us to identify whether the professional development was effective at all. So they've suggested that really we shouldn't be using these assumptions at all. We need to be thinking much more about what are the features of CPD programmes that we really know have an impact on, uh, on pupil outcomes. Um, and we need to start to try and understand more about the causal mechanisms. Why might CPD work or not work? So they've suggested that actually um, there's not really any strong evidence that including collaboration uh, is a characteristic of effective PD. Um, that's not to say there's evidence that it's not. It's just a lack of evidence um, to, to really make that firm claim. Um, so they suggest that it could be that whilst it might be a feature that's in lots of effective lots of interventions, it might be causally redundant. It might not be one of the features that is making that professional development work. So, um, so there's a yeah, there's there's a lot to look at there. Um, so just looking at the question here, I've got a question uh, saying Sims and Fletcher say the outcomes were limited to learner achievement rather than wider benefits for teachers. Um, yeah, this actually links back to to my point at the start, I suppose that um, that obviously looking at kind of quite a narrow definition of what makes things effective. If we're looking at um, benefits for teachers that obviously in the long run might have an impact on them being retained in the profession. Um, that ultimately, of course, begins to impact people outcomes too, but, but completely accept that we're looking at um, one sort of definition of effective in terms of outcomes for pupils. But there's something that I found slightly conflicting, particularly if we think about this, um, this notion of what, what does collaboration mean, that what Sims and Fletcher would go on to do in their paper is to talk about instructional coaching as being one of the approaches to CPD that has uh, really strong evidence to suggest that it's effective. Um, because it uh, incorporates characteristics which are known to promote habit change, they require teachers to repeatedly practice new skills, um, and they also note that of course the repeated re review and feedback that you get in coaching models helps to strengthen these. Now this could seem quite contradictory if they're saying there's no evidence that collaboration helps but also um, the programs that seem most helpful uh, or have strong evidence are coaching programs, um, and if you see one-to-one -one as being a kind of collaboration in some way then of course that would start to suggest that perhaps there is some evidence um, that collaboration uh, where it's used specifically for sort of review and feedback at least some elements of collaboration could be quite powerful so really there's a bit of an open question there we, we don't know yet enough according to Sims and Fletcher Wood around collaboration particularly in teacher CPD as I mentioned in the opening of course there is a difference between collaboration and collaborative environments and collaboration as a, a feature of CPD um, and uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. So what I then wanted to do if we accept that there are some challenges here because there's lots of different um, definitions of collaboration out there there's some questions about really does collaborative or does collaboration in CPD really make a difference what are the features of things that make a difference what should we be aiming for in collaboration um, I thought I'd explore what some of these pieces of research said in a bit more depth. Um, Van Grieck and et al, who carried out the, the review of, um, of research around collaboration, um, noted that there are sort of three types of preconditions for collaboration to work. Uh, a lot of this is, is based on qualitative research um, rather than the kind of quantitative research that I'm going to be talking about for most of this, but they found that lots of research um, noted personal characteristics is one aspect that might be important. So are your individual teachers willing um, and happy to commit to collaborate? Do they understand the benefits of, I don't really like the word teaming, but that's what they use. Do they understand the benefits of teaming? Um, and do they have, uh, uh, what's the kind of combination of skills, knowledge and experience that's brought together in the team? So those personal teacher characteristics seem to be important. Um, conversely, uh, rather than being a precondition one of the barriers seemed to be um, in some cases teachers were saying that they felt that they were working in quite a sort of individualistic and almost competitive environment in school um, which made collaboration perhaps less appealing as a feature. You've also got kind of structural characteristics so these are things like whether um, whether teachers actually have individual and common planning time this is something that, that we talk about a lot in terms of um, and timetabling how can you create time for your teachers to spend time together, even if you accept the value of collaboration, it can be hard to structurally create that time. Um, 
staff continuity so if you've got staff changes a lot that could be problematic physical structures how close together people are um, in the same buildings or not i'm actually going to talk about that a little bit later on as well um, and whether there are kind of formalized opportunities for professional interaction that that was one of the things but the main sort of most important preconditions for collaboration seem to be um, what what they refer to as group characteristics so um, this related to sort of how big the groups that were being asked to collaborate were, how long they've been there, and critically how supportive an atmosphere there was, whether the leadership supported that, and whether the group uh, of teachers felt um, that that they had this efficacy, had this confidence in their own practice. So uh, if we want effective collaboration, then these are the sorts of things that we need to be ensuring are in place. Um, a couple of studies looked particularly at uh, what was the collaboration around understanding that there are lots of different types of collaboration lots of different focuses of collaboration um, and one of these looked at PISA data um, from Germany um, and they they suggested um, there are there are sort of a number of different um, forms of teacher collaboration and they found that it was particularly uh, there was a small positive effect um, on pupil outcomes from teacher collaboration but only when teachers focused on discussing student achievement so that seemed to be quite important and that's something that's actually backed up also by uh, the Romfelt et al study um, theirs looked at this in a huge amount of depth trying to understand um, what types of collaboration teachers undertook what they were focusing on and what seemed to make a difference they actually found that all types of a collaboration whether that was around um, assessment whether that was around instructional planning um, whether that was around individual students that all they all had positive effects of collaboration but um, the most significantly predictive and most uh, uh, sort of consistently so um, was around assessment again focusing uh, the assessment they they um, include in that discussions around uh, some standardized tests but also discussions around formative assessment um, that was true for maths and reading um, and in reading they also they found that collaboration around instructional strategies seemed to uh, seem to be predictive of, of, of achievement gains so there are certain sort of topics or, or focuses of collaboration that seem to be particularly effective there's a, a massive table of those in that uh, in that piece of research if that's your area of interest um, Another area that seems to be important and was, was touched on in, um, in the review that I mentioned is this idea of uh, the importance of leadership. And um, Goddard, Goddard et al. study found that the principal's instructional leadership, where, where principals were um, providing strong instructional guidance and supporting teachers, that seemed to be uh, really important in those schools um, having high quality collaboration high levels of collective work so there's definitely a relationship here between leadership and collaboration as well um, which is again probably pretty unsurprising but but interesting to highlight nonetheless this was one that i found really interesting this next study um, um, james spillane and his colleague looked at uh the kind of physical building layouts and whether those seem to matter um, looking at the kind of traditional what, what they refer to and are generally referred to as kind of egg box schools um, and they found that actually physical proximity really did predict staff interaction so teachers and school leads were much more likely to interact around instructions if they were physically close to them during the day of course some of that will be perhaps to do with um, schools being organized uh, by subject area and things like that in secondary um, or by year group area in primary um, but being close and having reason to bump into people did seem to uh, to, to be um, a sort of prerequisite for people interacting and collaborating so there's something we can think about there when we start to think about how we sort of organize our schools how can we make sure we're creating opportunities uh, for people to to come together informally as well as the more formal collaboration so the point I made earlier about staff rooms perhaps has a, a bit of a relevance there moving away from central staff rooms might be reducing the amount of kind of um, more informal informal collaboration and sharing that's happening um, I also wanted to go back to the teacher CPD standards and um, look at those in a bit more depth because once we've kind of understood some of the perhaps prerequisites for collaboration working it's worth trying to understand why collaboration seems to make a difference um, why why is collaboration important why might it have an impact on uh, teacher retention teacher job satisfa satisfaction and pupil outcomes um, the, the more detail that comes under the teacher standard around collaboration and challenge starts to suggest some ideas here. Um, 
that actually maybe peer support for problem solving is important. So what you're doing there is really po pooling your expertise, pooling the experience that you have. Um, discussion about practice and supporting groups of pupils, again, pooling needs, sharing the expertise you have in your school. Um, and I think that's both expertise and your knowledge of particular pupils. Of course, these provide opportunities to come together and say, oh, how are you supporting pupil X and finding out what's working? They also highlight something that, um, that is widely recognised, Rob Coe's mentioned this too, that, that one challenge with collaborative approaches can be bringing in sufficient challenge. So you need to make sure you've got some way of bringing in new perspectives, otherwise schools tend to just risk um, re-embedding the same practices that they're already doing. So, uh, so an element of challenge there being important, challenging people's thinking, bringing in new perspectives. Um, and that comes into this last point as well, modelling and challenging from someone in a coaching role. And that could be someone external, that could be someone internal, but just making sure that you've got these kind of different perspectives. Um, in, the, in the point around coaching and mentoring, you've also got perhaps more of a sense of a, a, a novice and an expert working together, um, rather than kind of peers sharing. You've got this idea that perhaps um, you're, you're pooling, you're sharing the expertise of particular individuals. One other thing that I think um, perhaps we sort of underestimate here is that actually part of what makes collaborative professional learning in, in particular seem to work is the idea of the commitment that you're making to your peers. Um, we all know that it's very easy to plan to do something, um, whether that's a part of our professional lives or our personal lives, um, and uh, think, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. I'm definitely, this year, I'm definitely going to do X. I'm definitely going to run a marathon. But if you haven't got um, a, a kind of motivation, a kind of self-motivation to do that, it can be quite tricky. It can be easy to not end up doing what you plan to. Um, uh, this model that you can see on the screen is around the idea of teacher journal clubs and um, the approach that a teacher journal club takes is that you as a, a small group you'll read a journal article um, you'll reflect on how that might be relevant for your practice you'll make some plans for how you might trial some of the ideas from that in your practice um, and then you'll come back in a month's time um, and discuss what you did now, one of the things that seems to make this plausibly an effective approach, uh, and this is very similar to exactly what we see in things like teacher learning communities and things like the embedding formative assessment approach of Dylan William, is that you're making a commitment to your peers that if you go on a piece of uh, CPD, um, a, a training day, whatever it is, if you read something, quite often you'll think, oh yeah, great, I must try that in my classroom. But then the reality is changing habits are very hard. Uh, classrooms are very busy places. And sometimes those things never quite happen and you come back in six months time think oh I never did try that thing but if you've made a commitment to appear that you're going to do something and you're going to come and share what you've done um, a month later it seems that it's much more likely you're going to actually do that um, an example which has nothing to do with collaboration but I think is quite interesting here is the whole notion of implementation intentions um, Harry Fletcher Wood has written a great blog about this for pupils as as well and this is the idea that if we just say oh yeah I'm, I'm going to try uh, and I don't know embed more retrieval practice into my classroom um, and you just make that kind of vague commitment it's unlikely that you'll go through with it but if you make a much more specific plan it's more likely that you will so um, there's an example here from from medicine um, which looked at people taking up free flu jabs um, and they tried three different approaches um, they had a slip that they handed out that just said here's the dates here's the places that you can go and have your free flu shot they had a version that had a, a space on the slip for someone to write down the date they were planning to go and have it just a note for themselves and they had a version that had a date and a time um, and they, they found that those who had to write down the date and or date and time were much more likely to ultimately go and have the free flu jab than those who uh, had just been given the slip with the information. And those with the time were slightly more likely than those with just the date to do so. I'd love to know what this looks like if you, uh, if you had some kind of paired or collaborative version of this where you committed to going uh, and having your flu jabs together with someone else. Um, so, so this idea that perhaps this commitment that you're making is quite an important part of why collaborative professional learning works as well as all of the other things we've talked about. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of research that I've seen around collaboration is a, a piece of work from another piece of work from James Spillane um, who carried out some research looking at well what, what he was expecting to see was that um, teachers would have a reasonably good idea of who the most effective teachers in their school were and that they would approach those effective teachers for advice. Um, what he instead found which I think is really interesting that actually 
the higher performing teachers were not more likely to be sought out for advice by colleagues. They were the ones who were the most likely to go and seek advice. So there seems to be a correlation here between effectiveness and an enthusiasm for kind of engaging with discussing learning from others um, rather than it kind of being about teacher expertise. It's about that, that kind of collaboration, that discussion, that reflection being really powerful. I think this has some really important implications for how we um, seek to get teachers working together. This made me think of work that Chris Brown has done. Um, he's developed the sort of research learning communities model, um, but he's also previously, uh, well, the research that, that he's done um, includes a particularly interesting approach to kind of mapping how people seek advice across schools. Um, and it, what you can see on the screen here, on the left-hand side is a school that's quite research engaged where um, teachers are engaged as part of a sort of research community. And, each of the dots represents a teacher and the line between them is where they say, yes, I asked this person for advice or they asked me for advice. You can see the one on the left is really networked. There's lots of lines coming out of lots of teachers, um, a real sense of teachers all talking to each other about teaching and learning. On the right is what a sort of less research engaged, less sort of research learning community style school might look like. You've got a few sort of key players that people are lots of people are coming to and then you've got a lot of people that aren't really particularly connected in or are only connected into one person um so the idea of trying to kind of promote a climate where all of your teachers are engaging with each other bearing in mind what what Spillane et al found around the the sort of uh correlation between teachers asking for advice and seeming to be more effective seems really important um so why might it work We've, we've touched on a few of these and just wanted to sort of highlight them. So maybe the commitment point is important. If you make a commitment to do something to your peers, you're more likely to do it. Might be the challenge and alternative perspectives that are really important here. Um, it might be the opportunity for reflection, for discussion, um, for thinking back on your practice that we know we all want to do, but perhaps it's sometimes hard to make time for if you aren't doing that in a sort of structured way. Certainly something about sharing knowledge, um, our knowledge of our pupils, our knowledge of practices and our expertise across school. And also perhaps just something about this sense of being part of a whole, of not being an individual, this sense of being part of, um, of something bigger than yourself, a part of a profession that's really making a difference. Um, the, the kind of egg, egg box notion of, of schools sort of has this idea that you're quite kind of isolated in your individual classrooms. And that's certainly something that um, resonates with a lot of teachers I talk to, that it's strange because you're on show 24 hours, not 24 hours a day most of the time, but, uh, but certainly a large number of hours of the day, you're on show in front of your class. It's um, hugely uh, draining, um, but you're not actually with other adults for much of that. So the chance to, to sort of feel part of a collective rather than slightly isolated in your classroom, not really knowing what others are doing in their classroom um, is a risk. So if we can create more of a sense of being part of a whole, that could be really powerful. So let's think about some of the approaches that, um, that we might use around um, collaboration and whether they really are collaboration or not, whether they might be valuable or not plausibly. Um, the title of my, my talk was about collaborating or doing the same thing at the same time. Um, I guess that came from the idea that when I wrote the title that I was thinking, you know, doing the same thing at the same time probably isn't really collaborating. And by the definitions that we've talked through, um, it probably isn't. And yet, is there some value to that? Um, there are interesting things like uh, the Centre for Education and Youth, I believe, have been running a kind of reading group where people re do their own reading. It's not about um, a sort of book group where you have a book or a journal article that you all read. It's about making a commitment to spend some time on, on reading something and sharing. And that kind of comes back to this commitment point. It's just that actually it's hard to make time for ourselves and to prioritize things like reading and professional learning. But perhaps if we make a commitment to a colleague that will do that or to multiple colleagues that will do that, it makes it more likely we'll, we'll prioritize that, we'll make the time for it. So there could be some value there. Um, one of the aspects of, of uh, collaboration is also this idea of kind of spreading the knowledge of champions. It does seem to be um, an effective way to work. Um, uh, Carabo Jackson colleagues in, in the US have looked at a model which, um, which found that you can sort of spread new approaches and new uh, conversations about pedagogical approaches by using a kind of champion model. So sometimes collaborative approaches are definitely using that. So um, sort of 
focusing perhaps on training particular individuals, engaging with particular individuals and hoping that they cascade things. So that cascade model of collaboration can seem to work. Um, coaching and mentoring, um, uh, obviously Sam Sims and Harry Fletcher would mention this, but instructional coaching in particular seems to have uh, some pretty solid evidence that it can make a difference to pupil attainment. It can really change teacher's practice. So that kind of one-to-one -one engagement, whether we accept that as collaboration or not, does seem to be quite a powerful model. Mentoring as well, hugely important around the, uh, the kind of retention piece, around the job satisfaction piece for teachers early in their career, having someone who is supporting and developing them. So powerful collaboration potential there too. Then we've got um, the next kind of batch of these all kind of go together in terms of peer collaboration, opportunities to just be working with your colleagues. Um, this makes you again feel part of a community, giving opportunities for commitment. Uh, particular models for that, like lesson study, like professional learning communities, um, like research learning communities, collaborative inquiry models, all give more structure to that, which perhaps might be more likely to lead to sort of um, positive outcomes to uptake. So uh, giving a sort of model where you are, you are sort of given particular things to discuss, particular approaches to take, and you're encouraged to share those at the end. Um, something that we, we don't do a great deal of really is, is things like the kind of actual co-teaching it's rarely possible um, in, in timetables to do that, but um, an interesting experience and obviously something that, that happens in teacher training a lot, the chance to actually teach together, to see someone else teach, but be kind of engaged in that practice. And um, I've specified here collaborative curriculum design, lots of work around how powerful collaborative curriculum design can be both in terms of um, the sort of curriculum that's produced, but also the ways in which teachers knowledge um, is increased through those processes, the discussion, the reflection that they have around sequencing, around uh, what should be included, it in turn sort of impacts on the, the teacher's um, own knowledge and expertise. So lots of different ways that we might look at collaboration and really it might depend what purpose we're after. So that's really what I want to um, sort of wrap up this main section with is some things to think about if we're doing this. The first one being, you know, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve with collaboration? If you're trying to encourage more collaboration in your school um, at the kind of grand level, is it um, sort of collaboration where you want to um, create a more professional environment, improve teachers practice immediately? Is it collaboration to make teachers have higher job satisfaction? Um, are you trying to um, sort of share the knowledge of certain experts? Are you trying to create more of a peer model? What is it that you're trying to do? Make sure you reflect on what we know around causal mechanisms. There's plenty that we don't yet know, but what, what are the reasons that this might work? Why might the approach to um, collaboration you're thinking about plausibly work? What are the preconditions that need to be in place for that? Um, we've talked about leadership as being one of those. We've talked about you know, actual proximity as perhaps being one of those, so physical layout. So think about those practicalities. Um, reflect on all the things that we don't yet know, the challenges from, um, Sims and Fletcher Wood, for example, around whether, whether really collaborative um, elements are key to professional learning or whether they're a sort of redundant, and redundant element of effective professional learning. And also thinking about both formal and informal collaboration, um, creating opportunities for kind of water cooler moments as well as more structured collaboration. Um, of course, there's a very particular context at the moment that we're thinking about, thinking about how do how do we create opportunities for collaboration in an environment where actually it's very hard for our teachers to be together? A lot of them are, may not be in school, but even if they are in school, of course, uh, we aren't wanting large groups gathering together. In fact, we're actively trying to avoid um, teachers being together. So there are some really interesting um, discussions to be had about how we can use um, technology to enable these kinds of things. Um, we, need to, we need to think about actually what, what does remote coaching look like? There's some, some great research around this. My colleague's written some great advice around uh, coaching that's on our, our Early Career Hub, which is a platform we've, we've recently released to support early career teachers and their mentors. Um, how do we get remote coaching right? Um, it's very different to being face-to-face. -face. We've piloted some of these things in a couple of our different programs as well. So there are important areas to focus on around um, how we can continue to enable collaboration. Of course, wonderful events like today, like the whole Research at Home series, creating a, a sort of chance to engage in professional learning with other colleagues. Um, there's an interesting conversation we've been having internally at the Chartered College recently about the difference between uh, a kind of 
uh, I guess a webinar like this and a kind of vlog or a pre-recorded presentation um, and how how different they might feel because of, of course actually um, whilst it's great that you can ask questions and I can, can see a couple popping up which is great um, it is still primarily at the moment at least me me talking at you so how different is that from a pre-recorded video and what our perception was was that there's still something about feeling like you're there live watching with um, however many other people makes you feel more part of that collective that being part of a community is really important and, and the kind of way in which research ed um, is creating that community online I think is really powerful um, okay I'm gonna just um, make a couple more comments and then I'll pick up these um, these questions so um, references I mentioned uh, most of the things that I've mentioned are already in um, a list of reading at that link there the tiny.cc slash school culture it's a it's a wider reading list it covers a whole range of other things around building strong professional culture um, there will be a few more references added in there after this session that I didn't quite get to um, this morning uh, and also a thing that you might like to have a look at is uh, we published a free international um, report around trends in teacher CPD which picks up a lot of these ideas there's a whole section looking at kind of different approaches to collaboration and collaborative models um, that's free to download from our website you'll also be able to purchase a print copy from amazon fairly soon thanks uh, thanks to john cat who've um helpfully uh, created a print version of that for us um a very brief um promo for the chartered college um if you're not yet a member hopefully lots of you are it's uh, the professional body for the teaching profession and i'm really interested one of the reasons i'm really interested in collaboration and in professional culture is that i see a key part of our role to be um building that kind of culture at a system level um working of course with a whole range of other organizations who are doing a great job of doing that that as well as the kind of collaboration opportunities the sense of collegiality within your school within your trust building that at a system level is really powerful and really important um and uh, that's really all that i had to say so i'll pick up um a couple of the questions now if that's okay helene um yeah, yeah. so um Interest about the preconditions, Gainer says, in Maths Hub, we have local leaders of maths education, professional learning communities, and been using five design principles in planning these. Um, I mean, I would love to hear what the five design principles are. Um, I, uh, if you have a look at the um, review that I mentioned, um, the preconditions for that are tables that run across literally two whole pages which is why i didn't go through all of them and went at the kind of top level groups as well but but gainer if you can pop in the q a what your five design principles are i'd love to um to hear about those um sarah's asked what's your view on peer observations focusing on the teacher's development focus and owned by the teacher who is being observed considering supporting teachers to become peer observers to support each other but ownership belongs to the teacher so peer obs or observations generally obviously um quite a uh, a kind of challenging area um we've i think we've seen massive strides forwards in this in the past few years um thinking about kind of the way in which observations used to be used offset observations but also in school observations with people being judged outstanding or not um are based on a snapshot of a lesson um i know rob co suggests that you might as well toss a coin in terms of your accuracy for those so that that's been it's been great to move away from those but I think experiences like that do have a long tail in terms of people's perceptions of observation and of course um, you know observation still part of uh, of how we kind of understand teacher expertise so what you're talking about is is absolutely the right way about it peer observation where um, teachers have ownership of of what they're doing a sense of peer observation again rather than manager observation important um, there's been some work done around how you can make observation effectively uh, effective because um, the, the biggest challenge does seem to be that there has to be a sense of trust and that it's not part of performance management that it's taken away from that that it's developmental that it's about um, receiving effective feedback and being able to reflect and act on that um, but research does suggest that that's quite hard to do um, there have been different approaches to this trying things like external observers because perhaps uh, you know if they're completely removed from anyone who's involved in making decisions about uh, your professional learning about your performance management might that help but of course the downside there is that you don't have the kind of contextual knowledge or the relationship um, there are simple things like obviously like what you're suggesting here sort of peer observers rather ideally rather than line managers doing the observation so that there isn't a sense of 
um, of kind of hierarchy there. Um, but teachers did still tend to feel, no matter the model, that it would in some way sort of be linked back to perceptions of how good they are as a teacher. So trying to break that, trying to make it um, uh, reciprocal, I suppose, that you've got people watching each other, really important. One interesting thing is also, um, again, particularly relevant now, is the use of uh, video observation. We've um, used this as part of the development on a couple of our programmes, and um, it's definitely quite uncomfortable to begin with. Uh, filming yourself while you're teaching. Um, I, I mean, I hate watching videos of myself back, so I have all the sympathy for this. But, um, but what we did find was that teachers did find that after they got used to it, they did find it useful. And, and one of the potential advantages there is that they have complete control over what they then share. So they might record their lesson, they would pick a particular snapshot of maybe 10 minutes, which they wanted to share and say, could you give me feedback on, say, my questioning technique? And that really did give all of the um, all of the kind of control to that teacher, what they were sharing with whom um, the video was for them to reflect on initially, but also they could get feedback. So there's something quite interesting about, about that kind of model, I think, um, and might be the way that, that we have to go in the, uh, the short term, at least. Um, Great, thank you. Um, yeah, again, I'd love to love to chat more about um, this. So the five design principles, Hargreave and Fulham were, were two of the other researchers I was going to suggest. It's well worth looking at. I didn't cover them today, but um, really great work. But again, as a five principles are establish, develop and revisit a common meaning and purpose, explicitly plan for professional growth, design for push and pull, model and expect high levels of professionalism, and develop collective and collaborative leadership. I think those sound great and it feels like there's a lot of alignment with, with those and um, the, the sorts of things that I've been talking about today for sure. Um, great, I think that's all the questions that I've got there. I don't know Helene if you had anything you wanted to pick up or um, well, I've, actually coming I've up just, to 12. <laughs> yes, yeah we'll stop soon but um, yeah you were talking about um, record, recording your yourself teaching um, and I do, I mean, I, I went through a phase where I did a lot of that. And of course, after the initial awkwardness and, and the cringe and everything, um, it is actually really, really powerful. You are in control. And of, it depends on the setup. But um, there are so many things that you can pick up that you would not pick up normally. Um, I, I, I used to find that really quite powerful. Um, you talked a lot about thinking about collaboration in terms of commitment to each other. And I think. So you mentioned the CPD standards quite a lot, and obviously I was part of that team. Um, and I think when those conversations were going on, it was this idea that you commit to a peer, and therefore there is there is a, a bigger incentive, if you like, to just keep going. Um, but Philippa accordingly was talking a lot about that formative assessment that you get from the other person as well. So th this process really allows you to grow professionally, and I think that that's the important bit. Um, yeah, there's an important point there, actually, that, that I can add this to my next version of this presentation is, is about feedback and um, that importance of receiving um, feedback that, that helps you to grow professionally as a teacher, um, which definitely is something that, you know, inevitably you only get through some form of collaboration. You can get so far, I think, with reflecting on your own practice via video, um, for example, but, but really the sort of um, feedback processes you go through in discussion are so powerful. Mm. Yeah, I really enjoyed the the whole notion of commitment. I think is really essential. Um, you also picked up on trust, and you know it's very very difficult to have a um, developmental model of peer observation if you don't have that trust. But it's not just trust, but or perhaps the trust comes from a reciprocal vulnerability, if you like, which which I think is is really quite useful, particularly if you having if you don't feel like it's part of a performance management cycle or anything like this. Um, yeah, absolutely. And splitting that out, you know, I, I do think these things will become easier the further away we move from from the kind of historical experiences of kind of um, judging lesson observations um, that will become easier. But uh, but yes, that whole idea and this very much comes into the Craft and Pape model as well of making sure that uh, that any kind of performance management as well, even where we are talking about performance management, is focused on improving the quality of teaching, not about kind of making abstract judgments. Um, there's been some great examples, people like Chris Moyce have, have done some great work um, mm -hmm. rethinking what their uh, performance management processes look like to make them being focused, be focused on professional growth. And of course, then the idea of abstracting um, 
feedback and observation from performance management is daft, but that's because the whole notion of performance management is totally different. Um, you want it to be part of that. You want engagement in professional learning, in professional discussions um, to be the thing that you're focusing on in, in terms of how you want to see your teachers improving and, and, um, and developing. Mm. When you think about peer observations as well, I mean, there are some obvious um, limitations if you think about the level of expertise or like simple, simply experience of, of the people involved. Um, and also the fact that sometimes you don't want to sound too critical of a colleague. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly, there are, you need other factors in there. So perhaps having this kind of a, a joint focus, for example, might, might be a nice way of, of directing those observations so that you actually have something to talk about that's specific. Yeah, and that, I mean, that, that idea of um, a sort of reciprocity there is really important because, of course, there's a huge amount of value in, in seeing someone else teach as well. Observation is not just about the person being observed, getting feedback. It's about you learning from watching someone else teach. I find it absolutely fascinating, even in, well, perhaps even especially in different subject areas, um, uh, my role now and, and my previous role working across a trust it, it worked uh, cross phase and you know I'd never seen a primary teaching lesson before apart from like in the two weeks that I had to do before my PTCE and just such a kind of different experience seeing that and you you learn and realize a huge amount from from that process so I think that's that's very true and, and again that idea of having a focus for observations is useful I think that also comes into um, the sort of instructional coaching model that um, you're not sort of thinking about all of the things that you want to improve in your practice or the whole of your lesson. You're thinking about one specific discrete um, sort of skill that you're going to focus on. And, and that narrow focus helps in terms of feedback, I think, um, as well as helping in terms of practice. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree on that kind of angle. Yeah, particularly if it's a cycle. So there's going to be a follow up. So rather than a one off event, if you like, um, if you have a series of planned uh, peer observations, that, that kind of process is really quite powerful. There's a last comment coming. Uh, yeah, from... great. Thank you. Um, so, Sarah, great to hear. So you've used video viewed in a small group. Um, I think that's great. You're making the point about reciprocity as well, that because you all share the video content, there was this sort of shared vulnerability. It wasn't just uh, a sort of um, one member of staff having to share with a senior, uh, which definitely I think can create a lot of concerns. And this idea of supportive coaching conversations is so important. I also liked, um, while we're on the topic of observations, though this has nothing to do with collaboration, but um, an idea that um, David Didow shared in a blog a few years ago, where he was talking about um, how perhaps Ofsted observations could lead, rather than kind of being about, again, sort of judgment of a lesson, could lead to a kind of professional conversation afterwards where the teacher explains the approaches that they took or explains why they did certain things. And I think that touches on your point, Helene, around um, sort of expertise of observers, that if you're having a conversation about um, the sort of professional decisions you made, that made, that moves it away from the observer sort of acting as if they um, they know better than the class teacher who has all of the knowledge, expertise and context um, that's so important. Mm. OK, well, that was really interesting. Um, someone is simply asking if the recording will be available. And yes, it will be. If you're happy with that, Kat. Yeah, of course. so I'll probably upload it by tonight or tomorrow morning. Great. Okay. What about the presentation? Are you happy to make available some of the slides? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, no problem at all. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Great. Kat. Thank uh, you very much. Thank I you very much. really, really enjoyed this. Um, have a lovely day, and uh, I'm sure you might get a few more questions perhaps online. <laughs> Great. Okay, everyone, uh, we'll see each other tomorrow again at 11. Uh, tomorrow we have John Tomset. So another one to, to look forward to. Have a great day. Thank you.